Right, so this is the second revision video, um, and this is on self-defence. So this is one of your three mock areas, so this might help you in terms of cutting down uh, some of your revision. Again, at the top left-hand side, I've written essay problem question dilemma, uh, simply because self-defence can be an essay, um, and hasn't been an essay for a long time, so probably quite a likely essay uh, for the exam. It can be part of a problem question, so you might have someone that uses self-defence um, and then ends up killing, for example, or injuring, um, and again, could be a statement or part of a dilemma board. Uh, with self-defence then, um, when I've spoken to some students, um, a lot of you are saying that this is probably the one you're most struggling with with revision, just because in ter there's not so much as like a structure. Uh, and I sort of get what you mean. With areas like causation, you've got your categories, um, even sort of something like in tox, you've got voluntary, involuntary, you've got sort of like a structure. It is a bit harder for self-defence, but if you look at the sheet that I've just done, again, I've just made notes doing this, but it might help you. Um, it might give you a bit of a structure there to sort of like stick to three main bits. So I've put the two part test at the top. In order to establish the defence, you just need to satisfy both parts. So did you honestly believe you had to act as you did? Did you honestly believe you needed to use force? And was it classed as reasonable? So you've got your subjective bit at the top. Did you think you had to use it? And then objective, would the jury agree what you've done is reasonable? So the way really I would probably suggest in terms of structuring it is, is take each part of the test separate. So part one, part two, and then the third bit at the end we'll look at later. Um, so part one really then, did you honestly believe you had to use force? Obviously that's quite a subjective thing. Um, and all I've done there is put a couple of bullet points underneath, necessary, imminent, preparation and retreat. You could sort of use those as subheadings. Um, so you could introduce it, that this is part one, it's a subjective test, then you could AO2 it, and then you could jump straight into the fact that it needs to be necessary, but the fact needs to be classed as imminent. So going back um, to what we've uh, been looking at already, or that we will be looking at duress, um, looking at that fact that it needs to be classed as imminent. So... That's how I would probably structure that first bit. So tell me it needs to be necessary. Tell me it needs to be classed as an imminent threat. And then I'd use cousins and Malnick, just with the fact that they counteract each other. So with cousins, it was an imminent threat. It was probably necessary. Whereas with Malnick, it was neither really, because there was no threat on him. And then I've just linked in who's saying with the house, um, just because that's quite a good one, because there's no imminent threat there. There's no threat whatsoever. The danger's gone. So you're sort of showing two things there with that one, that once that danger's passed, self-defence will never work. Then you could sort of link into your next paragraph the fact that if you prepare for an attack, you can actually get the defence. It's very, very wide. That is good for society, but then is it too good? Is it making it too lenient? Um, and you could use ADUF there with the petrol bombs. He was allowed to prepare and not get into trouble. Um, and then retreat is like a separate uh, category there as well so you don't have to show that you've retreated um you could it's still showing that your force was necessary so i think that would be quite useful there that really because some of you've been worried about structure to sort of use these um uh, as your little subheadings there so i do necessary in a minute as one the little next sentence you're allowed to prepare and then retreat and then that's you sort of covered the first part of the test did you think that you had to use force and as long as that force is necessary and imminent like we say uh, that's fine part two of your test then was that force reasonable now this has obviously done like a complete entire loop so it started at 100 percent objective then we've got a little bit uh now we've got your 90 10 split i suppose so largely objective uh, but looking at characteristics, then we went completely subjective with Scarlet. So that's why I put Scarlet there, which was ridiculous. And then Aweena has brought it back to what it is today, which is a largely objective test. OK, um, so that's sort of your main discussion point there. Plus, you've got the whole big area of Clegg. Um, so what you might be looking at here, realistically, um, is whether you've got reasonable force or whether you've got, oh, sorry, uh, whether you've got excessive force there as a result. So if that force is classed as excessive, um, that's going to fail, which is what it was with Clegg. So you might be using that word probably quite regular uh, with part two because you've got reasonable force and obviously you've got the opposite there. Um, so yeah, using Scarlet there then, so Scarlet changed it back to a subjective test, 100% subjective. Um, you can't judge self-defence 100% subjective on this part and this part, because then otherwise it's just going to be too easy for you to satisfy it, and that's not what we want there. So we want this bit to be subjective, and we want this bit to be largely objective, which is what it is today. So it works quite well. 
okay um i would then also obviously ao2 clegg and i'd add in the point that today it could probably get loss of control which would reduce it down at the end of the day he was doing his job so again you've got some good judicial reasoning there uh, your sort of last paragraph that I'd probably talk about then is just whether a psychiatric injury is relevant there. Because this is a 90% objective test and it does look at your state of mind, the negative impact you've got there, psychiatric injury is not classed as being relevant. So poor Tony Martin, that's why, again, another reason why he never got self-defence. First of all, he's hit them in the back, but then also um, his psychiatric evidence wasn't relevant. But do remember he got DR in the end. Um, and then obviously this bit here, I've just looked doing the intoxication video. Um, mistaken intoxication will never work. You've got O'Grady and Hatton, but we've also got mistake on its own will. So if you make a mistake to need to, for the thought of needing self-defence, uh, that would work. So again, if you've got a problem question, a section B, and they've made a mistake, but it isn't through to intox, Beckford would be part of your AO1 there. But if they have you add intoxication, then O'Grady and Hatton would be part of your AO1. So again, it's just sort of linking a main case in that you could then use. That examiner would expect you to try and use as many relevant cases as you possibly can there. Um, so it's quite a popular area is this, but it's because it's a small area, you've just got to be aware that it can be um, any part really. So it could ask you a test essay on self-defence, in which case, I mean, um, You've got those cases there, but obviously you've got extra ones that you can add in. Um, if it's a problem question, the likelihood um, is you'd probably just do one for part one, one for part two, and then anything else that might be relevant. And then obviously dilemmas, you're just picking on what's relevant. Okay, so I hope that gives you a little bit more of a structure. Um, but as I've said, as long as you've proven that two-part test, did you think you had to use force? Was that force reasonable? Um, but obviously, we don't take psychiatric conditions into account. And if it's self-defence and mistake, we just need to check there's no drink there involved. Okay?